Good morning. Today's reading can be found uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17, 18, and 19. And that'll be on page 966 in your pre Bibles. Okay, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Thanks be to God. Hey, good morning, everybody. Happy post-Easter, Easter tide, uh, as we are in this week. And uh, it's been a minute, but you might recall uh, that last year we were doing a sermon series on 2 Corinthians. And uh, so we're picking that back up again today. So we're picking up the welcome register, the offering, the greeting, and 2 Corinthians. And I was looking back on my sermon notes. How come you guys clap for the welcome register, but you didn't clap for 2 Corinthians? That's, that's a question I have. Thank you. I mean, it's not for me. That's for the Lord. I'm just saying. So, you know. Okay. Any case, I was looking back at my sermon notes uh, to see where we had left off last year. October 16th was the last time we preached on 2 Corinthians. And I preached from chapter 5. And as I was looking at my notes, I saw that I had said something about picking up the remainder of chapter 5 the following week. But then the following week was missions month. And then the following week after that was Advent, and the following week after that was the Sexuality Series, and the following week after that was Lent, and the following week after that was Easter, and now here we are, the following week, and we're picking back up the sermon series from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So since it's been a week since we were here last, I want to start by just doing a brief uh, recap of where we've been in 2 Corinthians. A uh, number of you I know are new to the church in the last four months, and so uh, you'll come in new to the uh, sermon series here in 2 Corinthians. So let me start with the recap, and then we're going to pick up uh, these three verses here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. All right, so the letter of 2 Corinthians uh, was written by the Apostle Paul, and Paul was the apostle who initially planted the church in Corinth. And after Paul had established the church in Corinth, he then went on to plant other churches uh, throughout the Roman Empire. And while he was out planting other churches in other towns, he heard through the apostolic grapevine that some Jewish super apostles, some false teachers, had come in behind him and were teaching a false gospel in the church in Corinth. Now, this term super apostle was the term that Paul sarcastically used to refer to these false teachers. It's clear he doesn't actually think they're super, uh, quite the opposite. But this is the term that he gives them. And where Paul was kind of scrappy and passionate, the super apostles were eloquent, they were sophisticated, they were wealthy, they were credentialed. And generally, they managed to keep their robes clean. So Paul's ministry was marked by conflict and by persecutions. And the ministry of the super apostles was marked by success and fame. And so these super apostles had come into the church in Corinth, that they had seduced the Corinthians away from the pure gospel that Paul had taught, and they were teaching a false theology of glory. And they were saying that salvation in Christ meant sharing in Christ's victory and glory, not sharing in his defeat and in his suffering. And the Corinthians, under the false teaching of the super apostles, were losing sight of what it meant to die with Christ. But the Corinthians, of course, should have known from their baptism 
the necessity of both realities, both dying with Christ and rising with Christ. And to focus on only one or the other was to lose half the gospel. So Paul is writing this letter to the Corinthians to teach the Corinthians, to remind the Corinthians about the necessity of both suffering with Christ and rising with Christ. Sorrow and joy, death and life, how these are all held together in the gospel. So as we restart this sermon series, I've given it a a new second half title. And the title I have for this second half of 2 Corinthians is Yet Always Rejoicing. We're going to get to that expression here in just uh, the beginning of chapter 6. Yet always rejoicing. Not always rejoicing, but yet always rejoicing. Because rejoicing when life is good and easy, that's not especially Christian. Just about anybody can do that. But yet always rejoicing, even when life is hard. That's distinctly Christian. So more on that in the weeks to come. That's what we're going to be focusing on. That's what Paul is reminding the Corinthians. But today we pick up here in chapter 2, verses 17, 18, and 19, and God's ministry of reconciliation. Here in these three verses, Paul refers to the work of the gospel as the work of reconciliation. In verse 18, he writes, All this is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ. He goes on to talk about how God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. He speaks the same basic idea in verse 19. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself and has entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. So what's all this reconciliation talk about? Well, the term reconciliation that's used in the Bible is used pretty much the same way that it's used in the contemporary English. It means to change from enmity or hostility to friendship. And Paul is saying that the relationship between God and humanity has changed because of Christ from enmity to friendship. So I want to know three things from this text. First, I want to look at the two types of enmity here from this text that God's ministry of reconciliation is resolving, our natural enmity and our legal enmity. And I'll talk about those here in just a moment. And then I want to finish out this sermon by reminding us that this ministry of reconciliation is God's ministry. So let's start with this first type of enmity that God's work of reconciliation resolves, our natural enmity. In verse 17, Paul tells us that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Now this is a bit of a jab indirectly at these super apostles because the super apostles were all about the glory of the old creation. But Paul has been arguing throughout his letter up to this point that the earthly glory of the old creation is insufficient. Earthly glory comes and goes and comes and goes, and ultimately it goes. It doesn't last forever. Even the best uh, iterations of the earthly glory can't last forever. But the glory of the new creation The glory of the new creation is creation united to God's own life, and that lasts forever. And Paul is saying that if anyone is in Christ, then he is part of this new creation. But the chief problem of the old creation isn't simply that it was temporal and earthly and had a glory that didn't last forever. The old creation had become full of what we can call natural enmity. Natural enmity refers to the hostility towards God and His ways that inherently resides within human nature due to sin. So think about the story of Adam and Eve, which is the first place that we see natural enmity enter into the world. The story of Adam and Eve in many respects is like an archetypal account of all human beings. So God created Adam and Eve to live in intimate fellowship with Him, And he gave them only one law, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But they didn't listen, they sinned, and they broke God's law. And when they did, something broke inside of them. Immediately after 
breaking God's law, they turned away from each other in shame, and they tried to hide themselves from each other. And the shame that they felt wasn't just a sense of embarrassment, like you know, being embarrassed because you have something in your teeth. In the Hebrew language, the, the term shame or the idea of shame means to come to ruin. Right? So it's, a, it's more robust than how we might think about shame, it's just embarrassment. Adam and Eve have come to ruin. They've ruined themselves by their sin, and then they try to cover it up, but they're not just trying to cover it up from each other, they're also trying to cover it up from God. And so when God comes to walk with them in the garden, they run away from Him and try to hide, ashamed of what they have become. God was no longer a source of comfort, but had become a source of dread. And then things just go from bad to worse. Adam and Eve's capacity for love turned inward upon itself, and they blame each other for their sin And then when their firstborn child, the incarnation of their now inward-turned love, is born, he goes on to murder their secondborn. And then this natural enmity, this natural hostility that's been born in the heart because of sin is passed on to all of Adam and Eve's posterity. So as you continue to read through the, the book of Genesis, weapons are forged, more people are killed, The Tower of Babel rises. The whole world descends into chaos and violence so severe that God had to destroy the world with a giant flood and start things over. But despite the floodwaters, the natural enmity inherent within the human heart survives, and it has lived on into the present day. And all of us are born with a share in this natural enmity. So Paul, in Romans chapter 7, He offers a succinct summary of the human condition lived apart from God's reconciling work in Christ. This is what Paul writes in Romans 7. He says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. And this is the natural enmity of sin at work. But the good news of God's ministry of reconciliation is that God is resolving this natural enmity. So in verse 17, back here in 2 Corinthians in our text, when Paul says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation and that the old is gone and the new has come, he's talking about the healing of this natural enmity. And the Bible uses all sorts of expressions to note the resolution and the healing of this natural enmity. Jesus in the Gospels refers to it as being born again, or regeneration, or born of the Spirit. Paul uses the expression here of being made a new creation. Elsewhere, he talks about being made alive. The Apostle John speaks of adoption and becoming a child of God. And all of these expressions are not referring to the resolution of our legal standing before God's law, but to the miraculous work of new creation, of renewal that God accomplishes in our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit, which is exactly what the Old Testament prophets predicted that the ministry of the new covenant would be like. If you remember much about the story of Israel, Israel is given a law by God. It's written on tablets of stone, and this law is given to the people of Israel, but Israel is unable to follow the law, and they mess up on the law so bad, just like Adam and Eve in the garden, they mess up on the law so bad that they're driven away from God into exile. But there in exile, God has not forgotten or abandoned his people, and he sends word through the prophets that he is going to make a new covenant with his people. And this new covenant will be unlike the first covenant that was written on tablets of stone. So listen here to this new covenant that is made. It's prophesied in Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah writes, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house 
of Israel after those days, declared the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. And then you can read more about this new covenant. The prophet Ezekiel also speaks of this new covenant. And here, quoting uh, the message from the Lord, Ezekiel says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit and I will put with, that I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey all my rules. In the new covenant... The old heart of stone is removed. We're given a new heart of flesh. God places his spirit inside of us. He writes his laws internally on our heart so that we'll be careful to walk in his ways and obey his ways of love. And this is the new creation reality that Paul is talking about. Paul is saying the old creation, the glory of the old creation, it can't change who you fundamentally are. It can just give you rules that you have to try to follow and live by, but the rules remain outside of you. But in the new creation reality, under this new covenant, the rules of God moved inside, into your heart. You're transformed, you're healed. The enmity that is inside of you that makes you resist God's rules and God's laws is taken away. And some articulations of the gospel forget this reality and reduce the gospel to a matter of divine bookkeeping. As though the only thing that happens in the gospel for sinners is that sinners get forgiven. But nothing really changes inside the sinner. But that's a sort of truncated gospel that leaves the natural enmity still intact. The good news of God's ministry of reconciliation is that the power of of the natural enmity of sin is broken. Now, this doesn't mean that all of our natural enmity is done away with in one fell swoop. And healing a wound, just like a physical wound, healing a wound takes time. And sometimes we can still feel like we live too much like Romans chapter 7. But the gospel is not merely the good news that God has forgiven you. It's a good word that God is transforming you and changing you and healing the natural enmity inside of you, that you are a new creation in Christ, that the old is gone and the new has come. And maybe that's a word that some of you particularly needed to hear this morning, because maybe you too quickly reduce the gospel to nothing more than a mere change of status between you and God. But when you do that, you end up thinking that all of the change, all of the life change that is associated with the gospel depends fundamentally on you. As though God's part is forgiving you and then your part is living like you should. God's part is forgiving you and your part is healing all the natural enmity inside of you. And so you spend all of your own efforts and your own work trying to resolve all the internal tensions that you have inside of you. But that's part of God's work too. So in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. We're not our own workmanship. We can't recreate ourselves in Christ Jesus for good works. That's what God does. And this is part of his ministry of reconciliation. We can't just content ourselves with living essentially like non-Christians, but then just trusting in God's forgiveness, as though that's all it is to be a Christian. There's no fundamental difference between Christians and non-Christians, except that Christians just get forgiven for their sins and non-Christians don't. But that's a miss of what God's ministry of reconciliation is all about. Because when God brings us forgiveness, he also brings us new creation life. God isn't interested in simply simply forgiving you. He's interested in making you into a new creation. 
into the kind of person that both you and he want you to be. It doesn't mean that God's interested in morality for morality's sake. He's fundamentally interested in your joy. He doesn't just want you to become his child in name only, but truly and supernaturally to enter into his divine life so that you can experience the joy that comes from who he is. Nicholas Cabasilius, who uh, many of you no doubt have heard of, is a 14th century Eastern Orthodox theologian. Um, In any case, uh, I was referenced uh, him and something else that I had been reading, and he was, I was very fascinated by what he had written. So I bought his book, and I haven't read all of it yet, but I've been picking away through parts of it. But he says this about human adoption, which really stuck out to me, or spiritual adoption and human adoption. He says, un, he says unlike human adoptions, spiritual adoption does not consist in the mere name. In spiritual adoption, there is a real birth, and a sharing with the only begotten Son, not of the surname only, but of his very being, his blood, his body, his life. What then is greater than that the Father of the only begotten Son himself finds the very form of this Son in our faces and recognizes in us the members of his Son? It's so beautiful to think about God's adoption of us as not just a legal adoption in name only, that in his adoption of us, he places his very life inside of us. He truly makes us his children. He doesn't want to just merely be called our father. He wants to actually become our father. He wants to see the face of his son in our face. And that's what this ministry of reconciliation is all about. Or as the Apostle John writes in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, how great is the love that the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and you are. We're not just called children of God. We're called children of God because we are in Christ children of God. He has placed his spirit inside of us and made us his own because he loves us. Many of you know, if you've been around here for a while, you know that uh, we adopted our youngest daughter from Ethiopia, and she's not here this morning, so I can talk about her. Uh, she always she likes it when I talk about her, but you know, I want to maybe not this one, but but she's so precious to me. I love her as much as I love any of my other kids. And we've done everything that we can do to make her part of our family. You know, we've given her our name, we give her our resources, we give her all of our love and affection, but as much as we pour out our love upon her, we cannot physically, biologically make her one of our children. Her, she has another mom, she has another dad, right? And we can't, we can't replace that. But the beauty of adoption for God is that God's love is so great, it is so powerful that he actually makes us his own, that he places his spirit inside of us, draws us into himself so that his face, the face of his son is seen on our face. That's the kind of relationship he wants to have with us, right? So we can't take the gospel and the ministry of reconciliation and just reduce it down to we just stay exactly like we were, it's just we get our sins forgiven, right? God has drawn us to himself and he has removed the natural enmity that stood in the way of us being truly his children. So that God's ministry of reconciliation resolves our natural enmity, but God's ministry of reconciliation not only resolves the natural enmity, it also resolves our legal enmity. In verse 19, Paul sums up the message of reconciliation as God not counting our trespasses against us. And this is very welcome news, because no matter how much we might be healed from our natural enmity, no matter how much that might be resolved, all of us have blood on our hands that we cannot wash away. And no amount of good works, no amount of life change can undo 
what we've done. So returning back to the story of Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they not only broke themselves, but they broke God's law. And as a consequence, they were expelled from the garden, cut off from the tree of life, and essentially sentenced to death. And God's law, which was given to them as a source of goodness and guidance, came to stand over them as a sentence of condemnation. And that same law stands over you and I still today because all of us have taken a bite of the forbidden fruit and not just one time. The good news about God is that he is a good and just judge, but the bad news about God is that he is a good and just judge. And a good and just judge doesn't simply wave away injustices. As Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, the divine law of God is a record of debt that stands against us with its legal demands that we cannot fulfill. The debt into which we've fallen with respect to God's law is beyond our capacity to pay it back. We've transgressed against an infinite God. So how can we ever begin to pay back what we owe. In some breaches of our human laws, we can pay back what we owe. But there are some things even within the human realm it's hard to make restitution for. How do you unsay something that you shouldn't have said? How do you unhit someone that you shouldn't have hit? For some things we've done in the human realm, We can't even make adequate human restitution. How much more can we not make adequate divine restitution? Wislawa Zizborska, who is not an Eastern Orthodox 14th century monk, but is a 21st century poet uh, who I've not read much of, but somewhere I came across this poem uh, that she wrote, and it's called In Praise of Self-Deprecation. And it's a poem about carnivores and humans. And it just stands out to me here as it kind of relates to this issue of guilt. She writes, The buzzard has nothing to fault himself with. Scruples are alien to the black panther. Piranhas do not doubt the rightness of their actions. The rattlesnake approves of himself without reservations. The self-critical jackal does not exist. The locust alligator Trichina, which is a parasitic worm, I had to look that up, and horsefly live as they live and are glad of it. The killer whale's heart weighs 100 kilos, but in other respects, it is light. There is nothing more animal-like than a clear conscience on the third planet of the sun. And the point of Wislawa's poem is that what makes humans different from animals is that we feel guilt and remorse if we eat each other, but the animals don't. And that if we didn't feel guilt and remorse for the ways that we mistreat each other, we would be just like every other animal that has no conscience. And it's all well and good that we're above the animals, but how do we get free of our guilt? But here's the good news. In God's ministry of reconciliation in Christ, he dismisses all of our legal debt. And this is the point that Paul is making in verse 19. God, because of Christ's sacrifice, does not count our sins against us. The debt had to be paid, and it has been paid, but not by us, but by Jesus. And because the debt was paid by Jesus, we are free then from condemnation. And this, too, was part of the promise of the new covenant. So the author of Hebrews, who is talking about the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant, we can read this here in chapter 10, he writes this about the superiority of Jesus' sacrifice, the superiority of of the new covenant sacrifices compared to the old covenant. He says in chapter 10, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, It can never by the same sacrifices, all the bulls and goats that are offered, 
make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, they would, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Every high priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, his own sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sac- sanctified. Christ, by a single offering, has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. We're all in the process of being sanctified, having the natural enmity be resolved. But as we are in the process of being healed, Christ has offered one sacrifice that cleanses all of the legal guilt that stands against us. And maybe that's a needed reminder for some of you this morning. Because your sins have stacked up against you and you can't see your way free from guilt and regret. And no amount of hand washing or acts of reform can give you a sense of peace that all is resolved. And the things that you've said you can't unsay, the deeds you've done that you can't undo, they haunt you when you lay your head down on your pillow at night. But God in Christ has paid your debt in full through the sacrifice of Jesus. And the blood of the infinite Son cancels out your infinite offense against divine justice. And so we can be at peace this morning as children of God, knowing that Jesus has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. God's ministry of reconciliation resolves both the natural enmity and also all the legal enmity that stands against us. So let me close out here then by finally reminding ourselves that God's ministry of reconciliation is God's ministry of reconciliation. In verse 18, Paul says that the ministry of reconciliation afforded through the new covenant is from God. You see here in the text, he says, all this is from God. God is the one who in Christ has changed the relationship between God and humanity from a relationship of enmity to a relationship of friendship. And I think we can get so focused on the fact that God has given us this ministry of reconciliation to pass on to others that we can forget where it came from in the first place. The ministry of reconciliation is God's ministry of reconciliation. Yes, it's passed on to Christ, who passed it on to the apostles, who passed it on to us, who passed it on to the world. But the source and the summit of the ministry of reconciliation is God. It is from God, and it leads us back to God. He is the one who does the work of reconciliation. And God didn't wait for us to stop being his enemy before he moved towards us in a posture of reconciliation. So as Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 10, While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. So often in human relationships, when two parties are at odds with each other, both parties have a share in the blame for the state of the disrepair of the relationship. And in human ideas of justice, the party who is most to blame for the state of disrepair is expected to make the first moves to breach the gap and to cross the most distance in restoring the relationship, which, of course, in human relationships is complicated and tricky because we can never agree who is most to blame. And this happens all the time in marriages. Not in my marriage, of course, but I've heard that it happens in other people's marriages. The wife thinks the husband is completely impossible, totally to blame, and needs to do the most work to reconcile the relationship. While at the same time, I heard an amen. <laughs> I heard an amen. <laughs> While at the same time, the husband thinks the wife is completely impossible, totally to blame, and needs to do the most work to reconcile the relationship. And truthfully, this happens not just in marriages, this happens all the time in friendships and family and beyond. 
and both think the other person is chiefly at fault. And so they sit on opposite sides of the table, expecting the other to move towards reconciliation. But that's not how God's ministry of reconciliation operates. The full responsibility, the complete and total responsibility for the broken relationship between God and humanity lies on our side of the table. We wrecked ourselves with our sin. We racked up a legal debt that we couldn't pay, all through no fault of God. But God, at great cost to himself, knowing that we are the ones to blame, because of the great love with which he loved us, he has made the first and decisive move to repair our broken relationship with him. And he has bridged the entire distance himself. When we didn't have it in us to even take the first step, when we could not because the natural enmity had too strong of a hold in us, he came all the way to us and held out his nail-pierced hand in a peace offering. And it's so important that we never lose sight of this lest we fall into the trap of thinking that the burden of repairing our broken relationship with God lies chiefly on our side. If we forget that God is the source and the initiator of reconciliation, then we start to imagine when we sin that God moves away from us, arms crossed with a scowl on his face, expecting us to close the relational distance. But that's not how it is with God. We cannot pay our legal debt. We cannot pay it. And we cannot heal our heart. But in Christ, God has fully done the first and is currently doing the second. And God's heart is like the heart of the father in the story of the prodigal son always looking down the road in hope, always waiting for our return, always wanting to see us. And his care in our lives is like the care of the good shepherd who leaves the 99 out in the open field to go and find the one who is lost. And his willingness to sacrifice is like a king who gave his life on a cross. And God doesn't require some meritorious feat of strength on our part. He doesn't make us climb up the church stairs on our knees like Martin Luther thought he had to do. God in Christ has reconciled us to himself without our help. And the whole message of the gospel is summed up in Romans 5.8. But God showed his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. All the enmity that stands between us and God, the natural enmity in our hearts, the enmity against us through the divine law, God's love for us in Christ is bigger than both. And that brings us all the way back around to our review and theme of 2 Corinthians. It's because God's love is big enough to do away with all of our enmity, that we can rejoice in Him even while we're still in process. Because even after we've been baptized and we're coming to church and we're reading our Bible and we're doing our best to live for God, we're still a work in progress. None of us have arrived. And the larger message of 2 Corinthians is that we can always rejoice even when we're in progress, yet always rejoicing no matter what. Dying, yet always rejoicing. Misunderstood, yet always rejoicing. Mistreated, yet always rejoicing. Wrongly accused, yet always rejoicing. What about this one? Still struggling with sin. Still being sanctified, yet always rejoicing. God loves us and is reconciling us to himself. So what do we have to fear? Let's keep our eyes on him, keep holding to him in faith, and he will bring us all the way safely home. Amen? God, thank you for sending Christ. Thank you that he is our reconciliation back to you when we could not...
remove the disease of sin and the natural enmity within our heart that makes us reflexively stand against you and your ways. Thank you that you have made us new creatures in Christ and have given us a new way of viewing the world and viewing you and new power through your Holy Spirit to live in the ways that you want us to. Thank you, God, that you do not count our sins against us. We stand daily in need of your forgiveness. We thank you that you are changing us, and we look forward to the day when that change will be complete and full and final. So help us to always rejoice along this road of faith as we walk it, knowing that you are with us and you are bringing us home. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.